Okay, so starting off today's show, we will be starting the same way we start every Monday edition here of the Zach Kroll Sports Podcast. When we're talking college basketball, going through each and everything that went out and went on during the week, and I will be giving you guys my top 10 main takeaways of the week before we get into some other things a little bit more in detail. So, without further ado, boys, hit the music. Here we go. Takeaway number one. Creighton started off the season struggling. When you watched them, they didn't look themselves. Their offense was stagnant. If you remember, they lost a big home game to Marquette early in the Big East Conference season when they had a decently sized lead. And you really thought, okay, is the loss of Tayshawn Alexander really just going to hurt this Creighton team? And are they ever going to be able to recover? Well, after watching Creighton the past two weeks... They are officially back. Their offense was humming against St. John's. They put up 90-plus in a blowout win. They then beat Creighton by 30-plus, which was super impressive. They also had a close win on the road against Providence last Saturday. So all of a sudden, the Creighton Blue Jays are starting to play some of the best basketball in the country. And I feel like it's been a while since Villanova has played a basketball game. Obviously, covid has really been affecting them and the amount of games they've been playing as of late. But I think right now when I watch Creighton, my eyes tell me that they could be just as big of a threat to win the Big East as Villanova. Mahoney averaging 15 a game just about. Zagorowski averaging 14. Jefferson, one of the most improved players in college basketball. He's averaging 12. Bishop averaging 11. Ballack averaging 10. So Creighton has five players Averaging double digits, one of the most balanced and improved teams in the country. Keep an eye out for Creighton because they are getting better and better. Takeaway number two. Alabama is playing the best basketball in the SEC. And I totally understand. Before you guys all start coming after me, Kentucky fans, Kentucky's playing some great basketball too. And we're going to get into them in a little bit. But Alabama's been super impressive. They followed their big-time road win against Tennessee last Saturday by beating Florida at home. And if you've paid any attention to Alabama basketball over the past couple years, you know that they never, ever are able to beat the University of Florida at home. They were able to do that on Tuesday night. And then over the weekend, they get a big-time win against their rival, Auburn. And if you watch this game, you saw that Auburn got... Their freshman point guard, Sharif Cooper, eligible. It was his first game of the season, and he was a little erratic at times, but he really provided the Auburn offense with a nice spark and was really able to get them going. There were many moments throughout the game where you thought Auburn was going to win because they were just hitting ridiculous shot, and you guys know the pace that Coach Bruce Pearl likes to play with at Auburn, but Alabama took a punch and really responded. The backcourt made up of uh, Shackelford and Primo and Petty has really responded since Nate Oates uh, suspended John Petty and James Rojas, two older guys on the team for a couple games. And really since then, Alabama has waken up and they've been playing great basketball. The SEC remains to me a wide open league. Um, Alabama's playing some great basketball and they have a very good chance to win it. Would I call them the number one threat to Tennessee? I think I would because the way they're playing is just super encouraging. They have a very talented roster, and we'll see. Tuesday night, Alabama heading to Rupp to take on Kentucky. Takeaway number three, Rutgers has officially fallen back down to earth, but that shouldn't diminish what Ohio State was able to do on Saturday at the rack. And by the way, I'm not calling Rutgers a bad team. They've just had a really rough three-game stretch. Over Rutgers' last three games, they've lost a really close game at home to Iowa. They then lose on the road to Michigan State. Tough loss. And then they lose that Saturday uh, Saturday at home to Ohio State. And it was a tough loss. It really seemed to me that Rutgers was just lost on both sides of the ball throughout the game. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Obviously. Lee, Ron Harper is still a little banged up. Geo Baker is still coming off the injury, so they're going to need to get both those guys going. Also, their young big man, Cliff Amori, he's been out as well, so 
you're going to want to get him back, provide some good depth. But Rutgers in this game just really struggled to make shots. Ohio State was the tougher team. They executed better. And as a Rutgers fan, it's got to be super unfortunate when you consider the fact that you have now lost to Ohio State two times this season, and you had them on the ropes the first time they played. I do believe that was a game Rutgers easily could have won. So it's got to be frustrating if you're a Rutger fan, and especially when you play in the Big Ten. We all know just how difficult of a league that is. But when you look at Rutgers' upcoming schedule, I'm going to be curious to see what direction they go in from here. Because right now, inside the Big Ten, Rutgers has a conference record of 3-4, and four, which isn't awful. But they're going to have to make some ground up the next couple games. They will go, or excuse me, host Wisconsin and then go to Indiana and host Michigan State. I think if they could go 2-3 and three in that stretch, that would be good. As for Ohio State, I still think people are sleeping on them a little bit. No C.J. Walker, and they go to Ohio State, or excuse me, they go to Rutgers and get the job done. Chris Holtman remains, to me, one of the more underrated coaches in college basketball. Takeaway number four. Danny Hurley has done a great job in a short amount of time turning around the UConn program, and not enough people talk about it. I watched UConn up close on Tuesday night against Marquette, and the reason why I was so interested in this game was because it was going to be the first game that UConn has played all season outside the state of Connecticut. And I was very curious to see, even with no fans, how the UConn Huskies would play on the road in Big East Conference play. Because they've been pretty good so far. They've been very solid, but at the same time, all of their games were in Connecticut. And I was so impressed with the way Coach Hurley's team got down in this game, and then they were able to respond. If you watched early in the first half, it looked like Marquette was going to run UConn out of the gym. There was a point in the second half where Marquette had an 18-point lead, but UConn did not give up. I was super impressed with the way Tyrese Martin played. I was super impressed with the way Isaiah Whaley played, one of the more underrated players in the country. He is a glue guy that really is able to do everything for this UConn team. And in the second half, UConn outscored Marquette 42-23. to Whaley had 15 in this game. And how about my guy Tyler Polly? Coming off of a torn ACL, he drops 23 points in 24 minutes. And the crazy thing about this game is UConn didn't really get that much scoring from their scoring guards. Tyrese Martin didn't even score. RJ Cole had five, and James Booknight was banged up, and he gave UConn six. And still in the second half behind Isaiah Whaley, 15 and 13, and Tyler Polly with 23. UConn outscores Marquette 42 to 23 in the second half and gets the win. Super impressive. And as for Marquette, you have to be better. Steve Wojo eventually wants to be the head coach at Duke. He is not going to get that job given these results. Takeaway number five. Michigan may have played a very easy schedule to start their Big Ten slate, but they're really, really good. And now that they have taken a little bit more of a bigger approach when it comes to who exactly their competition is, they deserve a lot of credit because they blew out Minnesota. That game was not particularly close at all. They also played very well against Northwestern. They had a road win at Maryland. And I think when you consider the fact that this Michigan team lost a lot from last year's squad, they lost Johnny Teske. They lost Xavier Simpson. They lost David uh, DeJulius, transfer portal kid. And people think DeJulius could be one heck of a player for Cincinnati. But still, Jawan Howard has not been phased. Franz Wagner, Isaiah Livers, they all have been playing great, great basketball as of late, and Jawan Howard deserves a lot of credit. Michigan right now, to me, is a top five team, and it's going to be interesting to see when they play in such a tough league like the Big Ten, are they going to be able to keep it going? Michigan's next two games are home against Wisconsin and on the road against Minnesota, a team that they just ran out of their ran off the court. So I'm going to be curious to see what Michigan does. We all know how good of a player Hunter Dickinson is. He's leading the Wolverines, averaging 18 points a game. And to me, he looks like one of the best freshmen in college basketball. You combine that with Livers and Wagner, two experienced wings. Shawnee Brown has become a nice, consistent scorer off the bench, giving the bench 
some offensive punch when they need. Eli Brooks is an underrated player. I think Michigan's really good. Jawan Howard deserves a lot of credit because he's done one of the best coaching jobs in college basketball so far this season when you consider everything that he lost. Takeaway number six. Right now, I wanted to give some props to Tad Boyle and the Colorado Buffaloes because I feel like the Buffaloes are always a program where they never get any hype because, let's face it, they play on the West Coast in the Pac-12 and they were originally in the Big 12 and people were confused as to why they joined the Pac-12 in the first place. But I feel like Tad Boyle has really established a nice culture since he's taken over as the head coach of Colorado. And I watched the Buffaloes up close on Thursday against Oregon and they ended up getting the win by a final score of 79 to 72 uh, and they're really good they have a kid McKinley Wright who is one of the most experienced and best players in college basketball he's been Colorado's point guard since he was a freshman since he stepped foot on the campus in Boulder in that game against Oregon in 36 minutes he scored 21 points uh, one for two from three six for six from the foul line and then listen to this 10 rebounds and 5 assists for McKinley Wright. He added himself a double-double. I was super impressed with that. Also really liked the way Colorado was able to take advantage of the fact that Oregon really didn't have enough depth to play in altitude with. And now the Ducks in history are 0-10 on the road in Boulder taking on the Buffaloes. And one thing I'll say about the Pac-12, we're going to get into UCLA in a little bit. They're playing some good basketball and they actually beat Colorado a couple weeks ago. And there are some other really good teams, USC in the mix. You also have Arizona, Stanford, Oregon. But I think there's an argument to be made that if you were to predict who wins the Pac-12 right now, Colorado could be on the top of your list because they're super experienced. The Buffaloes would have made the tournament last year if it didn't get called. And I understand they lost Tyler Bay to the NBA, but they did the best they could to replace him by bringing in Jeriah Horn. They also bring in... Uh, kid, uh, Bartholomew, Keyshawn Bartholomew, he could really play. They have some shooters like Maddox Daniels, who comes off the bench, makes shots. Not a lot of people know about him. So I think Colorado is a team to keep an eye on. They, when you pay attention to them, could be much better than you expect. Takeaway number seven. John Calipari in Kentucky may have just officially turned it around because I did not expect them to go on the road to Gainesville, Florida, like they did on Saturday, and just totally dominate the Florida Gators. The offense was humming, and I think if you ask Zach, how did Kentucky do this, there are a lot of things that could be said. I do think that returning Keon Brooks helps. I think we all agreed that we knew when Keon Brooks came back, he wasn't going to be some go-to scorer that was going to average 20 a game and completely turn Kentucky season around. But in the game against Florida, 12 points, 6 rebounds, 4 assists. And this is a guy that, let's face it, we know that he's played under John Calipari before. He's been through some battles. He was on a team last year that won the SEC regular season title. And when you combine that with the improved play of Devin Askew, with the improved play of Olivier Saar, obviously Dante Allen is getting a nice run, uh, especially since that Mississippi State game. But Kentucky just went to Gainesville, Florida, and punched the Gators in the mouth. You could tell that 10 minutes into that game, Kentucky was the better team. And to be honest with you guys, I wasn't that worried about them holding on because that was a vintage Mike White Florida Gator performance. Coming off a terrible loss to Alabama on the road where, yeah, you competed for Al for the first 30 minutes, but Alabama took it in the, in the end. I, I shouldn't say that's a terrible loss. I just thought that this effort coming off the loss was terrible. And if you listen to this show, you guys know I haven't been the biggest Mike White guy. I know the whole Keontae Johnson stuff that's been going down, losing him has obviously been really hard, and it's been good to see him on the sidelines doing better. But if I was a Florida fan, I would just want Mike White to do a little bit better than the way his team performed on Saturday against Kentucky. Takeaway number eight, and we're going to stay with Kentucky. Did you guys see the commitment of West Virginia big man Oscar Shibway to Lexington? I feel like John Calipari has now really adapted this grad transfer strategy. And when I say grad transfer, I'm not talking about any grad transfer. I'm talking about 
a grad transfer that comes from a big time program that mostly every college basketball fan knows that follows the sport that he think is good, but on Kentucky could be great. Let me give you guys a couple of examples. Reed Travis was a kid that really stood out during his time at Stanford. He was consistently one of their best players on the floor. But John Calipari saw that at Stanford, it was pretty clear that Reed Travis, if he stayed there, probably was not going to play in an NCAA tournament ever. So what did Coach Cal do? He said, Reed, come along to Big Blue. And even though his NBA stock didn't dramatically improve or anything, Reed Travis was a really good player for Kentucky. It, it just took a little bit of time. You also look at the kid now, Olivier Saar. He was a kid that, even though he was on a very bad team in Wake Forest that last year, really had no shot of making the NCAA tournament. Olivier Saar was a baller for Wake Forest. Oscar Shigwe, I think, could be the same thing. A guy who, it obviously didn't work out at West Virginia, but now he's going to come to Kentucky and be one of their top, top big men, and he should be able to flourish under John Calipari, um, especially taking the rest of the year off. I think that Oscar Shibwe, I was very surprised that he left West Virginia, but I think John Calipari has done a really nice job of getting these drag transfers. Nate Sestina from Bucknell was another one as well. I think it's a good strategy for Kentucky. Takeaway number nine. If I was an NC State fan, I would want to see better than the way my team played on Saturday. If you missed it, I actually thought going into this game against Miami at home, NC State could be a sleeper team that I could be willing to talk about. If you haven't seen NC State play this season, they've played in a lot of close games, and I've actually watched a decent amount of them. I really like some of the young freshman guards they have, including a kid by the name of Shaquille Moore, who has really stepped up and been one of their impact players. They have another freshman guard, Cam Hayes, who's been really good. Uh, they have bigs who have experience, Manny Bates, DJ Funderburk, some scoring on the wing with Devin Daniels and Jericho Hellams, but... I watched NC State on Tuesday night against Clemson, and they lost. It was a tough loss. But if you listen to this show, you know how good I think Clemson is and how dynamic I think they are. And they are very hard to beat on the road, especially. NC State went into the Little John Coliseum on Tuesday and actually played really well. They were winning for most of the game. Now, they blew it in the end. It was a tough loss, but okay, it's not a bad loss. It's a loss you never want to see, but NC State played really well in that game. I gave Kevin Keats credit after that game. He had his team ready to play. And once again, I've watched a lot of NC State basketball early this season. They had a tough loss against St. Louis, but I think St. Louis is a top 15 team, and that game was on the road. They were only playing with nine guys. They also beat Boston College. They have a home win against North Carolina. But the issue is, you have to play better than the way you did against Miami at home on Saturday night. Because now, you lose that game, you are 2-2 two and two in the ACC, with your next three games being at Florida State, home Georgia Tech, and at Virginia. Are we confident that NC State is going to beat either um, Florida State or Virginia on the road? Because I'm not, it may, may be tough. That's a bad loss for NC State against Miami, especially a banged up Miami team that was missing Chris Legs and Cameron McGusty. If I was an NC State fan, I would have wanted to see my team come out with a little bit of a better effort because the ACC is wide open and I think they could be good. And takeaway number 10, the final takeaway here on my top 10 things from week six of college basketball is USC and Andy Enfield are another team that is playing really good basketball. We're actually going to get into the UCLA Bruins and everything that's been going for them over the last couple weeks, good and bad. But I wanted to give a quick shout out to Andy Enfield. We all know historically, USC has been a team kind of similar to Texas, who we're going to get into later in the show as well. USC has been a team that has always had a bunch of talent, but has never been able to get the job done in terms of grinding out victories. And early in this season, they had a couple of okay wins, really beat up BYU, but then had a close loss to UConn. And then they went on a coronavirus pause. Since they've came back, they are 4-1 and one with a road win against Arizona, a road win against Arizona State, and a home win against Utah. And I think USC, last year, we got robbed of a chance to see Onyeka Okungwu and what he could have done in the NCAA tournament. I actually think USC, last year, they would have been like a 7 or 8 seed. They would have been in their best position to win a tournament game. But this year, 
they have some guys on this roster that are impressive. You have the two Mobleys, obviously, who everyone knows they are both scary, scary good. They have some shooters on the wing that I think can play. Isaiah White, Taj Eady, they, uh, Drew Peterson, the transfer from Rice. Andy Enfield has done a nice job bringing in some transfers to this program, and along with the development of guys like Max uh, Angbakpolo and um, guys like that, Noah Bowman, another transfer they bring in, I think USC, they won this game without Ethan Anderson as well. I think USC could be a team that makes some noise going forward. And in the Pac-12, another conference that's wide open, we all know they have the talent to do it.